Hello, friends. Welcome to Wednesday night, and thanks for joining our live stream online, The Hopeful Life, 1 Thessalonians. We're picking it up tonight in 1 Thessalonians 4. Before we jump into the lecture, I want to ask you to, first of all, pray for us right now as this is airing. We are conducting a welcome home class, Dana and I, with new folks that have come to Emmanuel. We have classes on site as well, and so uh, pray for the teens tonight, pray for the kids tonight. Pray that uh, God will just uh, let his word uh, go free in the hearts of people tonight and right now as we study God's word together. Secondly, I want to mention that this weekend we begin a new sermon series called Cultivating a Healthy Soul. Jesus is a strong Savior who cultivates or builds or grows uh, flourishing followers. So we're going to unpack in the coming weeks How do I flourish in God's grace? And actually, tonight's study goes really well with the idea of flourishing and cultivation. So, with that, we're beginning our 17th lecture in the book of 1 Thessalonians. We are picking it up today in 1 Thessalonians 4. We began this study last week, the hopefulness of holiness, yielding ourselves to the sanctification of of sexual purity. So we're going to read verses 1 through 8 of 1 Thessalonians 4, but I want to set up, just remember and remind you where we are in the journey. First three chapters, Paul is remembering, he's affirming, he's gushing with praise and thanks and affirmation for the the church at Thessalonica. He's reminding them of the work that God did the way Paul ministered in their lives, and the relationships that they built, and how much he loves them, and how much they love him. It's all there, okay? The reason I say that is God's directives always flow out of God's indicatives, or God's directions for our lives always flow out of his love for us, and what he's done for us, his grace and mercy. So the context of this is not an oppressing Lord just slamming down his dictates with no logic, no reason. No, actually, when we are saved, we're the children of a fabulously loving father who wants what's best for us. And then he begins to not just lavish on us love and grace and mercy and forgiveness, safety, protection, security, hope, promise, all these wonderful things. He begins to then cultivate us forward. Uh, The word, one of the words he uses to describe this is called sanctification. It is the living out of my truest identity. It is the flourishing of all the seeds of truth and and fruit that God's put in me. It is the um, living out of who I really am now that the Spirit of God indwells me. We call it spiritual growth. We call it maturity. We call it sanctification. Uh, We call it the good work that God is doing in us. It is that forward journey that will take the rest of our lives. It is becoming conformed to the image of Jesus. It is being filled with the Spirit of God so that the fruit of the Spirit takes over in my life and the works of the flesh are overcome. It is a, a transitional Um, transformational reconstructing of who I am from the inside and letting it show up on the outside. So chapters four, five, and uh, four and five, I should say, first Thessalonians is Paul's instruction, the spirit of God through Paul instructing us with God's directives, God's commands, but they flow as we established last week from his loving heart. So let's look at verse 1. Furthermore, then, we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as you have received of us how you ought to walk and to please God, so you would abound more and more. For you know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus, for this is the will of God, even your sanctification. Now that's where we left off last week, okay? And we called that first thought the, the heart of hopeful living. Why? Because it's a familial heart, brethren. It's a pleading heart, I beseech. It's a challenging heart, I exhort you. It's an authoritative heart, the Lord Jesus, our authority. Um, 
that we ought to walk this way. Why ought we to walk this way? Because it is best for us and it is pleasing to God at the same time. And it ought to be our desire by the Spirit of God to abound more and more that we would grow in these things in a free will uh, following of Jesus. He says later, for you know what commandments we gave you by the Lord. But think about this. Since where I left off last week, a commandment if, is for someone who doesn't understand. For someone who understands, there should simply be instruction. Do this, uh, and, and you understand the reason and the logic. As a young Christian, sometimes we simply need God's commands. We need to trust him enough to accept his commands, even when we don't understand them or them, okay? Why? Because we know God would not command us to do something if there weren't a good reason for it that was uh, really deeply beneficial, okay? If I um, was walking behind Haley on a, on a mountain trail and I saw ahead of her a snake in the path and I yelled out and screamed at her, Haley, freeze! Um, she probably wouldn't turn around and throw her arms up and go, why do you always yell? She would probably just freeze. Why? Because she knows at the heart of my command is a heart of love and passionate devotion and protection for her. So my command is not oppressive. It's actually a command of protection. It's a command of deliverance. If she steps forward, she's going to get bit by a snake. If she obeys my command to freeze, I will be able to tell her there's a snake up there. Step back slowly. Come back here towards me. Okay? Now, understand this, my friend. When God gives you a command in Scripture, it is from a loving heart, and an explanation follows. Okay? There is always good reason for your flourishing, your safety, your protection. What you ought to do is also what is best for you, what produces the most joy and happiness and fruit in your life, and the greatest flourishing, the greatest soul and life, health and blessing. I mean, I could go on and on and on that all of this flows from the good heart of God. Okay, I want you to see verse 3 before we go to point 2. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification. Here it is. God has a plan and a purpose. He has a will for me. That will is not a threat. Many people fear. They're afraid of the will of God. My friend, the will of God is what you were made to live out, okay? The will of God is, is, is like the will of loving parents on Christmas morning who would will that their children wake up and come down and sit by the Christmas tree so they can open their presents. The will of God is his uh, best heart unfolding in your life, okay? What is the will of God? And I love this word, even your sanctification. Now, the word sanctification has to do with purification. It has to do with maturity. I already talked about all the ways we uh, uh, describe sanctification in Scripture. But our salvation really is broken into theologically. Let me go theologically at this for a minute. It is justification followed by sanctification, okay? Justification is the moment I trust Jesus, I am fully justified. I'm declared righteous by God, but I'm not sanctified. I mean, nothing has practically changed uh, about my attitudes, my thinking, my behaviors. All that is still convoluted and sin-tainted. I've been forgiven of my sin. God's Spirit lives within me. I've been made a new creature, but the practical fleshing out of that, the practical realization of that takes the rest of my life. So growing into who I really am, okay? It's birth followed by growth. Um, my wife right now is babysitting uh, Brady. Brady was born as Larry and Mariah's son. He is Larry and Mariah's son. Does he know how a son of Larry and Mariah should live? Does he know how to do all the things that a son of Larry and Mariah should learn to do? No, but he's got a long road ahead of him, and he's growing, okay? This morning, he was spitting at me. He just kept doing that over and over. 
And I was stirring it up. Dana was telling me not to do that. Why? Because his parents are trying to teach him not to do that. So now we have a problem because Papa's teaching him to spit and laughing at him when he does it. But his parents are working. This is the will of Larry and Mariah, even his sanctification, okay? He is going to learn behaviors that are becoming of who he really is. Let's face it, okay? If he's 18, if he's going to college, if he's going into his first job interviews at 22 and 23 after college, and he hasn't learned to stop doing this, he's got some problems, okay? So sanctification is a good thing. Brady needs to learn who he is, and he's learn how to live out of that, in that, and um, and let that be his true identity. Sanctification is not just you being changed against your will; it's your will being changed, so that your living out matches who you really are. Okay, your lifestyle. The the Bible word is conversation. Your way of living matches who you really are, your being. Your doing matches your being. But let me tell you another sense of the word sanctification. It ascribes value. If God wants to sanctify you, um, it is because you are valuable to him. It is because you are useful and purposeful and meaningful to him. And he has a will unfolding in your life. And your lifestyle and your your purpose in life and your doing out in life, your living um, has a reason. There's a value to it, okay? Let me give you a simple illustration. Um, I kept pulling dishes out of the cabinet over the last month and silverware out of the drawer and finding crusty stuff on it. Like, that just drives me crazy. Food, you know? And I'm like, that knife is dirty. And I pull another one out. That knife is dirty too. I've pulled bowls out that just crusted with stuff. And I'm like, what in the world? How did this get even unloaded out of the dishwasher. I, I won't talk about other family members who didn't look at what they were putting in the cabinet, but anyway, we found out that our dishwasher is broken, okay? And it took some time to diagnose. We tried to clean things out, but that didn't work. It's broken, all right? Why does this bother us? Because when you want to get a drink of water, when you want to use silverware that you can be putting in your mouth or a bowl or a plate, you want it to be clean. You want it to be and, and clean, by the way, is another way of saying you want it to be prepared. You want it to be well-suited to the purpose for which you have purchased it, okay? So God wants you clean. He wants you sanctified. He wants you prepared for his purposes and his blessings and his fruitfulness in your life. So your sanctification is is. There's a purpose to it, and that is that you are valuable to God. And if you don't cooperate with his sanctifying process, then you're going to limit your usefulness and your experience of his unfolding will and purposes in your life and all the flourishing and blessing that comes from that, okay? Um, You're not going to be able to participate in the purposes and blessings of God the way he would want you to, all right? So everything God's about to say, he doesn't really gain so much as you do. He may gain glory. He may gain um, the realization of his purposes through you, but ultimately your joy, your flourishing is at stake. Okay, so we've seen the heart of hopeful living. Let's look secondly now at the purity of hopeful living. What is God's will and my sanctification? Verse 3 that you should abstain from fornication. Abstain is cease, stop. Fornication is sexual sin. So this is God's sexual narrative versus the world's sexual narrative. The world's sexual narrative today is the basically the same as it's always been, okay? And that is sex as often as possible with whoever I want um, in whatever way I desire my desires rule, my passions rule, my lusts rule. And uh, so the general sexual narrative is a free-for-all, and it has been for thousands of years. It is oppressive. It is self-destructive. It is exploitative. It is using and tends to abusing others. It breaks down. It's hurtful. It hurts people. 
It hurts me. It hurts everyone involved. Sex outside of God's boundaries is always destructive. And the biblical word for it is fornication. And that involves sexual sin of all kinds, okay? From from sex before marriage to sex outside of marriage in form of adultery to uh, pornography to uh, all kinds of other activity that would be inappropriate sexual activity. Now, we established this last week, but God's the author of sex. God's not against sex. He just created it with specific functionality and specific place, placement, and inside the boundaries like fire, okay? Fire in a fireplace, in a fire pit, in a fire ring is healthy and wonderful and good. With all the right controls, with all the right boundaries, fire is wonderful, okay? But out of control and out of boundaries, like just in the middle of your living room, without a fireplace, a fire is a bad thing, okay? Fire is completely destructive unless it's bound up with the, in measure, okay? So it is with our sexual desires and sexual activity. God created the desires. We don't want the desires to go away. God created the activity. We The activity is life-giving. It's energizing. It's flourishing. It's multiplying. Um, our families grow because of God-honoring sexual activity, okay? Our relationships are made deeper, uh, deeper and richer, and our love is made fuller because of God-honoring sexual activity. But outside of those bounds... Our lusts and our passions rule, our feelings draw us, and, um, and, and they become destructive. Another illustration I use is water. Uh, water in a reservoir behind a well-constructed dam can be used. The force of that water can be used to create power. It can be used to be directed into irrigation and to aqueducts and to farmland. And in the right measure, water can bring flourishing life and energy and health, and it can sustain massive centers of population. But take that same reservoir and take that same dam and chip away at it, chip away at it until there's a little leak. And over time, that little leak will wear away at that dam, and eventually it's going to crash and give way. And all the water, all the same great, wonderful potential of that water becomes a destructive, crashing force that will wipe out farmlands and demolish power plants and wipe out entire population centers. And so is the power of our passions. So is the power of our sexual desires. Outside of the boundaries, outside of God's restraints, they're destructive. Uh, inside of God's restraints, they're constructive. They're life-giving. It's interesting to me that Paul goes to this first. Why? Because when he went to the Jerusalem council after his first missionary journey, and they were debating about whether Gentiles could truly be saved and whether they had to become Jewish, whether they had to keep the Jewish laws and ceremonies and systems, they landed on the fact that no, they could be followers of Jesus without becoming Jewish, but they gave them two preliminary instructions. And they said, we'll teach you more about following Jesus. We'll teach you more about God's uh, directions for your life when we come. But for right now, you can't really begin following Jesus if you don't immediately do these two things. Now, this was post-salvation and post-baptism. So the first thing we learn is the gospel. The second thing we do is we are baptized to publicly declare that we belong to Jesus. Okay, But the next two instructions that James and the leaders, the apostles of Jesus gave to Gentile followers was stop, immediately stop worshiping idols because you have become a child of the one true God. So put away immediately all of your pagan worship and all of your idea that there's a multiplicity of gods. There is one God. You belong to him now. So stop worshiping idols. Now, that's kind of fundamental to salvation. I mean, if someone says, well, I don't believe he's the only God, boom, then, then you're not really saved, okay? Salvation is I want to be, I'm placing my core faith and trust in the one Savior of the, 
of the one living and true God, the Son of God, Jesus. And he is my only Lord. He's not one God among many. He is the only God, and every other God is a false God. So the first instruction they said was, don't worship idols. Now, very closely connected to to pagan worship was sexual fornication, okay? Immorality, sexual pagan practice. In our day, the sexual narrative is, is almost exclusively psychological. In other words, it's not tied to the worship of a false god. It's tied to the worship of self. It is idolatry, but self is God, and my own psychology is God. And so if, if I want to be a woman, I can be a woman. If I want to be a transgender or if I want to be bisexual or transsexual or homosexual, it's all about my psychology. It's not about my physiology. It's not about God's morality. It's not about God's authority. No, the psychological self and the emotional self are, uh, are the idol that, that our secular world has enthroned and, confer- and and attributed deity to, divinity. The psychology of myself is the divine seat of ultimate authority. Now, here's what's sad about that. Not only is that self-destructive, but it is fluid. It is completely fluid. And what's really sad about that is the narrative is now touching 10, 8-year-olds, 9-year-olds, 11, 12, 13-year-olds who aren't even sexually awakened yet. And the sexual narrative is being poured into their mind that they are not the determined, created being of an authoritative God who calls them a man or a woman, who has conferred upon them a sacred gender identity, okay, that isn't to be trifled with. Um, It is to be recognized as sacred and given by God and is to be accepted and submitted to and operated within. No, 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 no. We've we've thrown that all away. There is no God. There's no authority. There's no binaries. There's no, that's all construct of man. No, you can be whatever you want to be. You don't even have to live by the boundaries of your own body. Okay, so we've completely psychologized the sexual narrative, and we've defined the self. Now, God defines me as a complex being, okay, mind, will, and emotions, a soul, uh, a thought pro- a process, an intellect with a will and with emotions and desires and with purpose and value. I'm a complex being, but the world comes along and says, no, you're solely defined by your sexual desires. So psychology, my desires are crowned king, lord, deity, and the sexual component of those desires is the very pinnacle of, of the place of worship. So the sexual narrative, the secular narrative says you are 100% sexual desire. So if you don't fulfill, experiment, explore, um, play around. Like explore your options with your sexual desires. You can't be true to yourself. Again, coming back to the fluidity of that, okay? Um, desires change. They're, they're fluid. They move. They're not static. So they can't define me. I am more than my desires. Not only that, sometimes my desires are destructive. All right? I desire donuts and pizza and pasta and comfort foods. I desire a lot of sweet stuff. And that desire needs to be restrained. Okay? We, we don't in any, in any part of life say, let your desires completely rule your life, except with sexual desires. And even then, the boundaries are somewhat arbitrary. Okay, now I, I digress. I'm kind of off track. Here's what, I, what I'm driving at. The very second command that the apostles gave the followers of Jesus, the new followers of Jesus was, abstain from fornication. Don't worship false gods and don't commit sexual sins. Bring your sexual behavior back inside the bounds of the marriage covenant. And outside of the marriage covenant, determine that you will 
submit your desires to the rule of the Spirit and the presence and the Lordship of Jesus Christ, that you will not be driven by your desires, you'll be led by a loving Lord, and you'll restrain your desires and place them in the proper boundaries so that they can be used to produce what God produces with them. So, verse 3 is very simple. From the heart of a loving God, we, as followers of Jesus, should abstain from fornication. We should stop. We should walk away. We should pull away from sexual behavior outside of marriage. Why? Verse 4. That every one of you should know how to possess. Uh, The word possess is to take ownership of, to occupy, to control. Okay? So this is about lordship. Really, at the, at the foundation of our struggles as believers, will I lord my own life? Will my desires and my emotions, will hormones rule my life, or will Jesus rule my life? And if Jesus is ruling in my life, will he teach me how to possess my vessel, that's my body? Okay, what God is saying is, the real you occupies a temporary body, and that vessel is a chemical factory, okay? And that chemical factory ebbs and flows with desires. Sometimes those desires are strong, and sometimes they're not so strong, and they recur, and they have cycles, normal, natural cycles to them. And we in Christ are to learn how to possess, okay? Think of this. Did you ever have driver's ed? You learned how to possess a vehicle, okay? I remember teaching Haley how to drive. What a terrifying experience that was. But I remember how tentative she was and how so often she was letting the vehicle do whatever the vehicle wanted to do. And I said to her, Haley, you've got to take control of this vehicle. Grab the steering wheel, put your foot on the brake, put your foot on the gas, get your hand near the the handbrake, take possession, okay? Do not let this vehicle do whatever it wants to do. No, you occupy it. You possess it. You tell this vehicle to go where you want it to go. Well, when we read possess his vessel for us, what God is saying is, I've put you in a vehicle temporarily that is still uh, able to do its own thing, your flesh, okay? And there's a struggle. Your flesh wants control. The Spirit deserves control. Your greatest flourishing and joy and happiness is going to be when you yield control to the Spirit. But you have the alternative, the option of yielding control to the flesh. In other words, letting the vehicle do what the vehicle wants to do. Now, if you're defined in your own head and psychology by your desires, then all you're doing is you're letting the vehicle take control, okay? And what Paul says is, no, I want you to learn, what Jesus says is, I want you to learn how to drive the vehicle, how to possess your vessel, your body, in what? In sanctification. God says, understand the purposes of your body, understand the prioritization, the care of your body, understand that you need your body to do my purposes, And value your body the way I value you in sanctification. And so let your body be conformed to my boundaries. Let your body honor me. Uh, Your body is your temporary dwelling place, and it's the dwelling place of the Spirit of God. So um, live in that body in a way that is a sanctifying journey, a maturing journey, a valuing journey that's going to best enable you to fulfill my purposes and experience my blessings. Um, Honor me in this and honor yourself and honor those you love and honor the purposes of God and honor uh, the blessings that God wants to realize in your life. And when we sin sexually, when we fornicate, we are letting the vessel do what it wants to do. We are letting the car drive, okay, And we're losing the value that sanctification calls for. And we're losing the honor 
that that we should experience in life in the purposes of God. Honor to God, honor to ourselves and to those we love, honor to the unfolding plan of God. Verse 5 contrasts, not, okay, so we're learning, this is a growing process, it's an ongoing war, okay, it's an ongoing struggle, we are learning how to possess our vessel, not in the lust of concupiscence, now the word lust is passion, it's desires, concupiscence is eager desire, the word concupiscence is the sense of, um, okay, um, getting ahead of uh, premature. See, the desire in and of itself is not sinful. It is letting the desire control so that it's fulfilled prematurely or it's fulfilled indiscriminately or um, illegitimately, okay? So concupiscence is eager desire. Concupiscence is letting the desire run free and letting the desire lead, okay? I want you to catch this, my friends. Sexual desire is healthy and good, okay? God created it. I, I've talked to young men periodically that will say to me, I've prayed and prayed and prayed for God to take away my desires. And I say, no, don't pray that. And they look at me like, well, that's, that's the problem. No, sexual desire is not the problem. Eagerness is the problem. A lack of learning how to drive the vehicle is the problem. A lack of restraints and boundaries and submission to those boundaries. Uh, we haven't learned how to restrain the desires and contain those desires in a reservoir and put up a dam and let the desires be channeled in the right direction. Okay, We haven't learned how to harness and put reins on and put a bit in the mouth of those desires. And, and then, and then um, lead those desires where they should go instead of letting the desires lead us. And this is the battle of every young follower of Jesus, that we are to learn how to possess our vessel in sanctification and honor, not letting our passionate, eager desires, lust of concupiscence, our, our sexual passions, our eager early desires, drive us forward, even as the Gentiles, which know not God. See, there's the secular narrative. The Gentiles are led around like a ring in the nose. They're enslaved to their sexual narratives. You know, that's really still alive and well on planet Earth today, more than it's ever been. The sexual agenda, the radical sexual narrative of our day is an enslaving narrative that says uh, we are nothing more than our sexual desires and we should be uh, bowing down before them and worshiping them and enslaved entirely to them. But the problem is that is a completely self-destructive journey. It destroys others, it destroys myself, and it doesn't lead me to the flourishing that God wants to put in me. My friends, we're going to pause there. Okay, we've seen verses 3, uh, 1 through 5, the heart of hopeful living, God's desires, God's love for me, the purity of hopeful living, that I'm to learn how to abstain from fornication and restrain and learn how to possess my vessel in honor to God and in honor to myself and others and all that God wants to do in me and in others and not give control of my life to the lust of concupiscence like the sexual narrative of our world. My friend, we are hounded constantly by this in our world. It's all mainstream, okay? And it's just getting worse and worse. God's directives to us for your flourishing in mine is that we learn how to possess our vessel and that we don't give our hearts and minds to the modern sexual narrative. Why? Because God knows more about sex than anybody that's ever lived. And God wants you to have the best sex, the best life, the best flourishing possible, and the greatest fulfillment in his plan. His plan is true and right, and anything outside of his plan 
is always, always, in the end, in the outcomes, destructive and hurtful. So we'll park it there. We're going to pick it up next week with verse 6, 7, and 8. And that will be the finishing of this particular outline. Thanks for joining me tonight, Wednesday night. I hope tonight was helpful and equipping to you. Have a great night.